ever since I was a small child, this has been my hero. This is Charles Darwin, of course. And one of the reasons he's always my, been my outstanding hero is because he looked at the same things that humanity had been looking at for centuries without seeing it, and he saw it, evolution. And he had no special tools, he had no high tech, it was just insight, a very powerful way of seeing the world. And he created an absolute revolution that started with telling humanity if we had our way, as a species, we would destroy this world. Because we will always seek to push evolution in our favor as a species. And of course, his 1859 manuscript, Origin of the Species, was the greatest revolution in biology for all time prior. And its basic thesis was, the strong survive, the weak, if they cannot adapt, cease to exist and go extinct. And while there may be controversies, he built the monument upon which the three great revolutions of biology today are standing. Metagenomics, the ability to mass sequence that which we see around the world and know its DNA at the absolute nucleotide level. Synthetic biology, the ability to manipulate that which we now understand. And gain of function, the ability to give species, capacities that nature never gave them, and probably never would. These three are the big revolutions. Let's start with metagenomics. This says, I can look at everybody in this room and tell everybody's DNA sequence. I now have that toolkit. You have that toolkit. And we can tell the sequence of everything in our natural environment. This is so revolutionary. It has so completely changed the way we look at the natural world, that it is at least equivalent to Charles Darwin's ability to revolutionarily think about the world. We go from looking into the world from outside, through the microscope, to actually deciphering it, because now the toolkit is available to rapidly, quickly, and cheaply tell us what is the DNA sequence of everything we choose to look at. And now we have the capacity to decipher life in a way we never did before. This is so new. It is all in the last decade and less in time. In fact, the speed at which this is happening is so tremendous that nobody in the entire scientific community can tell you where we stand in any given species analysis at any given moment. It's going that fast. And it is changing the entire perspective of humanity on the planet, even if you personally don't know the biology to see how fast and rapidly it's changing. We first sequenced the human genome. It took 15 years and billions of dollars. And then in 2010, we were able to do it for $10,000, an entire human genome. That's passe. Now it's under $1,000. So this is going faster than Moore's law predicted the declining costs in computer technology. The synthetic biology genomics revolution is taking the cost of sequencing down to a level that is really incremental. It's spare change. And you can buy your own home sequencer and be your own personal biohacker in your kitchen and sequence your whole genome now overnight, and it'll have cost you practically nothing to do it. Consider what the options are. Well, so a lot of people are out there doing their metagenomic sequencing of pathogens. Let's look at the Black Death Yersinia pestis, smallpox, chickenpox, the Justinian plague. And in every case, all the sequences are posted open source on the internet. You too can mess with smallpox. You too can mess now with Yersinia pestis, with pretty much any microorganism. 1918 influenza that killed 50 million human beings. Whatever you choose to play with, it's open source, it's being sequenced, and it's happening at lightning speed. And Darwin reminded us, all this information we will utilize only for the good of our own species. And in fact, the utilization is called directed evolution. That means humanity is deciding now what is evolution on planet Earth. We are changing the direction of the entire course of planetary history. And we're doing it in everything from high school labs all the way up to the most sophisticated multinational laboratory systems. Among the choices we're making is, which long extinct species do we as homo sapiens wish to bring back to life? 
This is not something that somebody else, God or whatever you believe in, decided. This is us human beings saying, I want woolly mammoths to walk on earth again. And indeed, already, a graduate student at Berkeley brought back a form of plant that had been extinct since the Devonian age. Uh, and it's back, it's alive, it's replicating, it's part of earth again. Who made that choice? This kid. And similarly, because of climate change, we're getting the devastation of permafrost zones and deep glaciated zones, and things that have been frozen for millennia are coming back to life. And scientists are making choices about which ones to resurrect out of the permafrost, like this Pandora virus, which fortunately does not infect human beings. But what else lurks beneath the permafrost? What's the next thing to come forward? Well, just, you know, three years ago, our National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. predicted, they thought quite boldly, that soon people would be building life up from the DNA, actually creating wholly new living creatures. This was considered outlandish, but it's already been done. So that entire report is now not only not controversial, it's ancient history three years ago. What's been done? Well, we've seen everybody t pick and choose how to experiment with life so that now the scientist is directing and is in charge of the evolution of everything which he or she is viewing, deciding the pace that the life they are observing will take, manipulating it to see what if, what if this is a revolution. Uh, and it's a revolution that gets coupled with what's called synthetic biology. Synthetic biology means, you might not know about it, but your kids do, because they're all doing it now in high school. It means that you are actually taking the sequences and manipulating them to produce previously non-existent microorganisms. There's a competition of high school students and college kids. Last year, 60 countries participated. Every team that participated had to create a previously non-existent life form and prove that it was alive and could replicate. And these kids were inventing all kinds of things, mostly very, very great, wonderful things. You would say, that's terrific. I'm so glad you made an asbestos-eating bacterium. But that this is also part of industry now. And every kind of company, from agriculture to cosmetics to drugs, everybody is now saying, why wait for the miracles to happen? We're going to go in there and direct life make it produce what we want it to make. And wow, this is a revolution for the industries. Huge profits down the lines, tremendous possibilities. Just in antibiotics alone, mining a single species of yeast uh, and going through their entire sequence to determine what synthetic biology could produce from it, come up with 20 candidate new antibiotics. So this means that there are tremendous upsides and fantastic incentives associated with this entire new sort of synthetic biology meets metagenomics era. Um, but just, I've had to redo this PowerPoint right up until this morning because things are breaking so fast. A whole new chromosome a higher order organism made from the DNA nucleotides up. It has now self-replicated, just published last week. So this is a man-made yeast. It's just one step away from the next stage, which will be multicellular creatures, but outdone already just announced this week, is man-made new DNA pieces. So instead of just A, C, T, G as the base pairs of DNA, there's now X and Y. And they have inserted it into man-made organism, and it replicated them. So now, welcome to a whole new world. Human beings have decided there shall actually be a form of DNA on this planet with creatures in it that can make not 20 amino acids, but 172 amino acids, which means a whole new encyclopedia of proteins is coming our way. Well, one of the people really that got all this ball rolling is Craig Venter, one of the greatest biotechnologists on Earth. Um, he was part of sequencing the original Human Genome Project, and he, in 1999, was the first person to create a previously non-existent organism. Actually, it had existed, he just replicated it, a phage, which is a tiny virus that infects bacteria. He proved it could be done, then he moved on, and in 2010 actually made the first wholly synthesized living creature, a yeast, and named it after his institute, the J. Craig Ventner Institute. 
It replicated, it's alive, it's sitting in freezers, but this is a man-made life form. So this was the first serious one. This year, he put out a new book describing what he thinks is the next stage. He says, stop asking whether it's GMO food or whatever, just ask, is the DNA man-made or not? If it's man-made, it's a synthesized organism. It's as simple as, as that. And now that we know that all there is to DNA is the actual sequence of the base pairs, that's computerized software. So now, life boils down to information, which he says can be transmitted. Where? It can be transmitted to somebody else's computer or to a 3D printer. And so he is now describing a new era, and he's testing it out with NASA, sending a launcher to Mars that will scoop up DNA samples and send them back to Earth, and he'll 3D print whatever's on Mars. That means time to stop thinking about DNA as a mystery and start thinking as an engineering project. Why think of 3D printers as being about wood and plastic when they can be about nucleotides, including even the new ones, X and Y? And your 3D printer can produce whatever you can imagine as a life form. This is our new era. It goes like this. You do your sequencing, it gets cheaper every day and faster every day. You send it to a computer anywhere in the entire world. You could be anybody with any motive doing this. It prints out through a 3D printer, and bingo, you have a life form. This is an impossible thing to regulate, an impossible thing for intelligence forces. And a key goal of synthetic biology is to give functions to life forms that they would not naturally have evolved, or at least we don't think they would have, um, to try and test the limits on what life forms can do. Now, it's called gain-of-function work, and it's extremely controversial. It was really kicked off by folks looking at bird flu, the H5N1 virus, which rarely infects people. People get it from birds. It's not spread person to person, but when a person does get it, 60% of them die of it. So this is one of the most dangerous viruses in the world. And several different scientific teams were wondering, well, why? Why, don't, why doesn't it spread between people? And they decided the best way to answer it was to go ahead and make a form of it, deliberately, in the lab, that would spread and kill people. So they made three different gene changes, three base pairs of DNA, two different labs independently competing. They ran the altered viruses through ferrets as a substitute for humans, and after a few rounds of passage in the animals, they indeed got an airborne mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmitting super bird flu. Well, this, of course, is, was highly controversial, but the Chinese said, eh, big deal. And they made 127 new bird flus, five of which spread through the air between guinea pigs, causing lethal infection in another substitute for humans, another mammalian species. So now we, we've opened the floodgates to human-directed evolution being about testing for virulence, testing for the transmissibility of organisms, altering them to infect different species. Um, we've also opened the door to creating factories for pharmaceuticals and all sorts of likely production. And finally, possibly, for using cells, man-made cells, as substitutes for animals for testing of drugs and uh, pharmaceuticals and so on. Is this safe? particularly when I tell you the pace at which this is all going on, and I describe to you the explosive nature of this research field. Well, the only control mechanisms we have over this are 1969 Biological Weapons Convention, the international health regulations, and which are to be enforced by the World Health Organization, which is frankly on the edge of bankruptcy. The World Health Organization has been running on a huge deficit for three years now, laid off 20% of its staff, and shut down its pandemic and emergency outbreak response capacity. So, oops, who is in charge here? Really, being in charge requires some kind of global solidarity that we don't really have right now. We, it requires transparency. Every nation, every group must disclose what they're doing and be honest about it. If you have an outbreak, you have to report it. You don't cover it up like China did with SARS in 2003. We have to figure out how to share not only the risk associated with this directed evolution and natural outbreaks, but the benefits, the vaccines, the drugs, which we don't, 
And we have to have mutualism, like the shark swimming with pilot fish. The big guys and the little guys have to mutually get something back and forth from each other that makes it beneficial for them to coexist. Uh, you know, can the big shark countries coexist with the little pilot fish countries in a way that is mutualist? This is the only way we'll get through this. Well, right now, that's not the case. As this gentleman taught me when I visited with him in Bangladesh, He's a poultry farmer, sophisticated guy. He computerizes all his farms, but his farm got hit by bird flu, and he was so upset by the pain and suffering of, that his chickens went through that he willingly went along with the government mandate that he slaughter his entire flock. Now, it's farmers like him that are keeping everybody in this room safe. They live in poor countries. Nobody's compensating them for destroying their infected animals, whether it's chickens, ducks, whatever. And it's in laboratories of this caliber that most of your safety is being ensured by grossly underpaid people that are trying to figure out what lurks in nature. And now we're going to throw at them. You think lurking in nature is bad. Wait till you see what we're going to make in the rich countries and throw your way as man-made directed evolution organisms. Try being ready for that one, boys and girls. It's not mutualism. We don't have the kind of world where the shared risk and benefit ratio makes any sense at all and can assure reasonable amount of safety for any of us or the animals we eat. So, what are my predictions? And you can hold me to these the next time you see me at some TED meeting. First of all, metagenomics is going to go on steroids. Costs are going to come down even more, the speed of these machines more. People are going to sequence the entire oceans. They're going to sequence entire forests. We're going to know more about the world than we can imagine. We will see larger organisms man-made. I predict that by the end of next year, a multicellular organism will be made, completely synthesized. Something nasty will come out of the permafrost or the glacial melts. And it's really just a question of what kind of living current species it will affect and what will science do with this nasty organism. We will see uh, the 3D printing of life become normalized, become a routine function of the pharmaceutical industry and food industry. It will become absolutely the norm. By the end of this decade, nobody will believe that any of you are even stunned by it. And the benefits of all this actually will be very real. We'll be looking at a 15 to $20 billion industry within uh, the next four years, five years, and many, many products that you will be utterly dependent on will come from the synthetic biology industry, but the speed of it and the safety of it will be dangerous, mistakes will be made, Something will leak from a laboratory or be deliberately leaked by uh, somebody of malevolent intent. And it will only then be that a moment comes when the nations come to their senses and think about how to properly regulate this new world. Thank you.